Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Corey. And I'm Ryan. This is Quick Study Television Weekend Edition. It is great to have you here as we continue to go through the Bible in one year from Genesis to Revelation. We're doing that and on the Weekend Edition with me are, of course, Corey and Ryan. Corey, what are you studying today? Today we're going to be looking at a few fun finds from around the time period of Judges and Kings. Fun finds? What yes. makes them fun? Uh, you'll see. You have to wait. You have to wait and find out. <laughs> okay, very good. I tried to trip her up, but yeah, it didn't work, did. Ryan. What are you studying? Well, today we're we're talking about one of my favorite subjects, and that is, of course, astronomy. And we're talking about the Big Bang's Big Three. The Big Bang's Big Three. This is going to be a good show. Very good. All right. Well, a little bit later on in the teaching segment, I'm focused on some interesting things. You know, we cry out to God, and He actually hears us. The God of the universe, the God who created everything, actually listens and hears me when I cry out to him and us when we cry out to him. That's a very important point that we need to talk about, and we're going to do that coming up in just a minute. Let's study off. The first fun find that you and I are going to be talking about in history today is a, a mention of ancient Israel in Egyptian hieroglyphs. So take a look. There is a scholarly storm that rages over the accuracy of the Bible's account. Many have cast off the Bible's history until after the time of Solomon. Its history is accepted at this point because the narrative can then be verified over and over again by non-biblical sources. However, the earlier biblical histories are becoming increasingly difficult to deny outright. Many years ago, three Egyptian inscriptions were identified, the oldest dating from 1400 BC. From a biblical standpoint, this would be about 50 years after the exodus from Egypt, and so six years into the conquest of Canaan in the days of Joshua. Remember that the conquest did not immediately include city building and an organized state. The books of Joshua and Judges portray Israelites living in already built Canaanite cities, often semi-nomadically until the time of the kings. These 3,400-year-old Egyptian hieroglyphs were found in a temple at Solub in modern-day Sudan. They're a listing of people groups in and around the land of Canaan. The term Shasu is used of these different peoples. It means semi-nomadic. Remarkable mention needs to be given to the Shasu of Yahweh. Despite the fierce battle over the Bible's history, it is acknowledged by all sides that these hieroglyphs clearly indicate the proper name of the God of the Hebrew Bible. This means a few things. One, there was a semi-nomadic group of people living in Canaan, distinguishable only by their devotion to the God of the Hebrew Bible during the period of Joshua Judges. Two, this pushes scholarship in the direction that the Exodus would have occurred before 1400 BC. The Shasu of Yahweh seemed to be treated differently in Egypt. Shasu groups were given a land designation. Instead, these Shasu were given a God designation. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. There are just so many uh, uh, small finds. I mean, I say small, they're not small in their impact, uh, but they're, they're not uh, huge earth shattering uh, finds, but they're extremely cool to the study, specifically of the Old Testament of the Bible. And a little bit later on in the program, we're gonna be talking about a bunch of miscellaneous finds that are all related to King Hezekiah of Judah. Now he is one of the more famous kings of Judah because he was uh, leading 
invading Judah and Jerusalem uh, during uh, a potential Assyrian invasion. There was an Assyrian invasion. They surrounded uh, Jerusalem uh, and Hezekiah cried out to God and God miraculously delivered Jerusalem. So while many of the cities of Judah were taking it, taken out, the capital city of Jerusalem was not taken. And that is the measure of whether a country in the ancient world, whether that country survived or fell. So Judah didn't technically fall because her capital city with the temple of the Lord survived. So this time period of Hezekiah is a very influential one within Israelite history. And there is a, 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 a plenty, there's a plenty of finds that are related to Hezekiah. Uh, there is even a potential portrait of King Hezekiah, the only one of any king of Judah. But now I'm giving spoilers. So uh, a little bit later on in the program, we'll talk about this and more. Psalm 142 is a passage of strikingly divine music. No person could write such inspired music. Now, when David faced difficult circumstances or his life was in danger, he cried out to God. But only the Holy Spirit could move his heart to write as he did. One of the reasons for these Psalms is to identify with us as we endure disaster. Now the Psalms says in verse one, quote, I cry out to the Lord with my voice, with my voice to the Lord, I make supplication, close quote. God ensures that we have words that we can identify with as we move through difficult circumstances in life. He makes sure that we know how to pray and how to cry out to him. If you have never prayed the Psalms, I encourage you to do so now. Psalm 142. I cry out to the Lord with my voice. With my voice to the Lord I make my supplication. I pour out my complaint before him. I declare before him my trouble. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then you knew my path. In the way in which I walk they have secretly set a snare for me. Look on my right hand and see for there is no one who acknowledges me. Refuge has failed me. No one cares for my soul. I cried out to you, O Lord. I said, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Attend to my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are stronger than I. Bring my soul out of prison, that I may praise your name. The righteous, shall surround me, for you shall deal bountifully with me. Psalm 142. You know, it's amazing to me as we come upon the end of Psalms, this is an amazing book of 150 pieces of music that God has sustained for us and put in place for us. And as we've read it this year, we have noticed some very interesting things that God speaks to us. But this is fascinating. We're talking about Psalm 142. Now, let me explain something. God is talking to us right now. And as we study the scripture today, we understand we are reading the word of God. And as we do that, I want to encourage you, if you don't have your Bible guide, why not? And we've gone through the Bible guide. I pray about it. And we've done our best to prepare it for you to introduce you to the Bible. That's an amazing thing, isn't it? Right for yours today. Send an offering in any amount. We'll be happy to send you the Bible guide. And also go to the website at www.biblediscoverytv.com and give there. And you can simply, it, it, just give an offering in any amount. And you can simply download the PDF files. Very important. Now, this is fascinating. As we look at this, I'm, I'm thinking about it. And I think, you know, in our steps of faith, 
we are being taught a lot of things from Psalms. You shall deal with me. And this is something that we need to understand. God has put us in place to deal with him. And if ever there was a time we needed to deal with God, that time is now, beloved. And as we look at this, let's understand why. We read Psalm 142 to 145. That is to keep up going through the Bible, and it's very exciting. We're going to look at Psalm 142, verses 1 through 7. And as we understand this, as we look at it, as we consider it, let's slow down and listen to what God says. So the scripture tells us, it says in Psalm 142, verses 1 to 3, it says, listen here, I cry out to the Lord with my voice. With my voice to the Lord, I make my supplication. I cry out to the Lord with my voice. With my voice to the Lord, I make supplication. Verse 2 continues, I pour out to my, or I pour out my complaint before him. I declare before him my trouble. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then you knew my path. In the way in which I walk, they have secretly set a snare for me. Now that is amazing. That is unbelievable. We look at that and we understand that when desperate, we, that's you and me, cry out to God. You and I cry out to God and he hears us. We must look to the Lord Jesus Christ for our solution. Now, Jesus Christ has the answer. Let me, let me make a statement. This is a very important statement. Jesus Christ, and, and I know this is going to be hard for some of you to take, because I know, you know, there's a lot of people who they think they know everything. So I'm going to tell you something. I want to tell you what I believe. I, I don't know anything. And, and, and any answer I get, I cry out to God. I say, Lord, what do you think? Because he knows everything. He knows the future. He knows the past. He knows, the, he knows all things. I don't know anything. So Jesus Christ is my Lord. You know, before I do anything, I say, Lord, what, what do you think about this? I'm in conversation with him on a regular basis, quietly under my soul. That's how we need to be with him. When we cry out to him and we have a problem, we need to say, Lord Jesus Christ. And the Psalms tells us how to do that. Well, it goes on in Psalms 142, verse 4. Look at this. Look on my right hand and see, for there is no one who acknowledges me. Refuge has failed me. No one cares for my soul. He recognizes that humans can't do it. When we cry out to God, there is often no one with us. We're alone. We must learn that we are never alone because God is with us. Let me tell you something. The Lord Jesus Christ is always there. Even when it feels like there's no one there, it feels like we're totally alone and isolated. We're not, because in those times, you can call out to God. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you can call out to him and he'll respond to you. If you do and you just feel totally alone and totally lost, he will come to you. Let me tell you something. Jesus Christ is powerful and strong. This world is full of sin curses, but Jesus Christ overcame those curses when he came and died on the cross, and then he rose again on the third day. Now, that's exciting. Because we have someone who can do that. Very important for you to understand that. As we continue on, we go back to the scripture in verses 5 through 7. It says, I cried out to you, O Lord. I said, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Attend to my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are stronger than I. Bring my soul out of prison. Look at that. Bring my soul out of prison, my soul out of prison, that I may praise your name and the righteousness you or shall surround me, for you shall deal bountifully with me. I love this part. You see, when we cry out to God, we are confident that the Lord not only hears us, but God will move heaven and earth to save us. And that is so important. You know, I've heard this story so many times. So many people, and I, and I, I hear it over and over again, and I, I thank God every time I hear it when somebody comes to me. And you know, I think I hear everything, and then I hear something new. I'm telling you right now, it's, it's amazing. And, uh, I, you know, I'm 54, and when this happens, this is amazing. I mean, there's more another person telling me an amazing story about God rescuing them. 
And this psalm tells us, he says, this is what you need to read to me. Cry out to me, God says. Cry out to me. Speak to me. And I will respond. Now, I want to tell you, Father, I pray in Jesus' name right now. There are people who are depressed watching this television program right now. And they want to cry out to you. And they're going to try. And they're going to cry out to you now. And Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the power of the Holy Spirit, reach into their lives and touch them and help them. Rescue them, O oh God. They need you today in Jesus' name. Amen. King Hezekiah of Judah was a tremendously influential uh, king, and he uh, reigned during a time period of great turmoil for ancient Judah. Here are some finds related to his life and reign. In the world of archaeology, Hezekiah, king of Judah, is a well-documented king. The designs of his personal signet seals are known. Tourists traverse his still open water supply tunnel and with flashlights try to read the recreation of the ancient inscription at its end. Supply jar handles stamped during his reign are now used to help date ancient sites and the finds keep coming. A 5 by 4 inch white limestone fragment has been found around the Gihon Spring in Jerusalem. This is the starting place of Hezekiah's tunnel. Engraved in its surface are six ancient Hebrew letters in form very similar to the inscription found in Hezekiah's tunnel, and they are written in a monument style. Since the surviving writing is so scant, the best researchers can do is hypothesize. The inscription can be dated to Hezekiah's reign and in form linked to his tunnel. Three of the surviving letters are even in the spelling of his name. So, Perhaps this is from a building that connected with the corresponding pool of the tunnel. Other intriguing finds have been seal impressions from three officials of Hezekiah. Two impressions from Damla, servant of Hezekiah, another two from Tobshalom, commander of the army, and one from Amar Yahu, son of Hananyahu, servant of Hezekiah. This Amar Yahu is actually in the Bible, though you might only recognize the English version of his name, Amariah. He is named in 2 Chronicles 31, verse 15. One last intriguing possibility related to Hezekiah was unearthed at Ramat Rahel, an ancient city now within the borders of modern Jerusalem. It contains ruins of a palace dated to the time of Hezekiah, and here a clay fragment with a painted portrait was found. Could this be the profile of King Hezekiah? We just want to say thank you to our partners who've helped us all get this far and continue to do so. Thank you so much for your support. It means a lot to us. This month, we are able to send out the first DVD in our Biblical History and Archaeology segment library. These DVDs are topical collections of Corey's aired television segments to help you dig deeper into the Bible's past. This first DVD is entitled Genesis and Early History. Its 30 segments discuss how the Bible was recorded, compares ancient creation mythologies to Genesis, taking on the accusation that Genesis is a borrowed pagan myth. They survey the flood of Noah from a historical perspective and take listeners through the time of the patriarchs Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. All 30 segments strive to be informative and engaging, and while all have been seen previously on Quick Study Television, they are now available for the first time in a DVD collection. If you'd like to have this first DVD collection of 30 of Corey's television segments, we would love to send it to you. For a suggested donation of $25 or more, we'll send you this informative collection of 30 television segments. Make sure to write or call and ask for Biblical History and Archaeology Segment Library, Genesis and Early History.
Thank you for staying with us here on Quick Study Television as we continue to go through the Bible. It is really good. And next time on Quick Study, I need to tell you that I'm going to be speaking about this. God's plans are eternal. We must do God's work, not our own work, because our work is not. So God's work is eternal. It's going to be very good. We'll talk about that next time on Quick Study. Right now, Ryan, what is going on? Well, you know, the Big Bang Theory is the standard cosmology of today's world. It's true. You know, most scientists today believe that the Big Bang is the correct scenario of the origin of the universe. And when one asks these astrophysicists why they believe that it is the correct cosmology, they usually put forward three big proofs. First, the expansion of the universe. Second, the abundances of the light elements. And third, the cosmic background radiation. But are these good proofs of the Big Bang Theory? Let's study. The name Hubble is synonymous with modern astronomy. There is the Hubble telescope, the Hubble constant, the Hubble length and diagram, and also the Hubble law. These are all named after the 20th century American astronomer Edwin Powell Hubble. And it was he who first promoted the idea of an expanding universe. Today this is almost unanimously accepted by both creationists and evolutionists alike. In fact, evolutionists often use the expanding universe as one of the major proofs for the Big Bang Theory. However, this is backwards, since universal expansion was already known about before the development of the Big Bang. Indeed, the Big Bang was constructed around the expansion, and therefore explains it, but does not predict it. However, many different models could be constructed to explain universal expansion besides the Big Bang. The steady state model is one example of this. From a creationist point of view, there are a couple of different interpretations of universal expansion. Some interpret the passage in Isaiah chapter 40 verse 22 as a reference to universal expansion. It says that God stretches out the heavens like a curtain. However, a closer examination of the original Hebrew reveals that the Bible seems to be presenting this statement in the past tense and not the present. How then could this be interpreted? Could it be that the Bible is referring to a stretching out of the heavens during the creation week? If this is the case, it provides an interesting solution for the light travel time problem. The light travel time problem is this. If the universe is only thousands of years old, as a plain reading of scripture indicates, then how are we seeing light from stars, galaxies, and other objects many hundreds of thousands of light years away? Indeed, light from these distant objects would take much longer than thousands of years to reach the Earth. Over the years, there have been a number of credible theories about getting the distant light to the Earth in a short amount of time. However, if God did stretch out the heavens during the creation week, then the light from stars and galaxies would have stretched out as well. This would mean the light was already visible by the time God created man. Therefore, one of the ways a creationist could interpret universal expansion is to consider the possibility that God created the universe in an expanding mode. This is actually a very good design feature, since if the universe were static, gravity would slowly pull the universe inward, causing a universal collapse, referred to by some as the Big Crunch. God is supremely wise and intelligent, and we would do well to pay attention to His Word. So, to review, universal expansion cannot be used as a proof for the Big Bang since universal expansion was already known about before the model was ever developed. Therefore, the Big Bang explains the universal expansion, but it doesn't predict it. And as I said, any number of models could be developed to explain the expansion, so the Big Bang is completely unnecessary. Next weekend, we'll look at the other two proofs for the Big Bang Theory. Now, Ryan, you, you said the Big Bang was completely, completely unnecessary. Is that right? That is absolutely correct. You okay, can make so, uh, a number of different models around the expansion. All right. That, that is absolutely fascinating because a lot of people think that when these new discoveries come out that they've got to modify their, their belief system or modify mm -hmm. the Bible to fit it, but the Big Bang was modified to fit something they already believed. That is absolutely fascinating. I think that's interesting. By the way, I needed to ask you a question. Mm -hmm. You talked about this uh, 
the sting of Hezekiah. Was it Hezekiah? Yes, Hezekiah. What in the world is that? It's, it's just a potential. You're, you're talking about the portrait. Yeah, the, the potential portrait. portrait. No one really knows for sure, but it, it appears as if it's a it, it's a king, and it was found, uh, I believe, at Ramat Rahal, if I'm if I'm remembering correctly. And uh, it's a little bit uh, horrible in my heart because I was actually there and didn't know. I came home. I, I was. You were there. I was there. I was at a conference. I was just relaxing, and uh, I was I was. Probably about 30 feet from the archaeological site that you could go to, you could visit, you could see it. And I wasn't aware until about six months after I was home, and then it broke my heart. So, <laughs> what are you so, going to do? I, so this is why we you, always need to study, we always need to learn, because. And go, to, go back to Israel sometime. But anyway, <laughs> that, that, that is absolutely amazing, and uh, that would be fascinating if it was. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, mm -hmm. it's very cool. It's very cool just to have a potential. Portrait. Well, it is, and they, of course, they because of the second commandment, they believe that you know they were yeah. very careful about not to make images, right? Not it's to preserve them. So we don't have mm. the artwork that we had like with the Romans and all that. Yeah, we have motifs uh, from the Judeans, from the I Israelites, uh, pictures of plants and things like that, but no, not very many representations of. Second humans. commandment says, "Don't make a graven ev image mm. of anything," and so they took that seriously. So that is very, very interesting. When we cry out to God, it must be for a good reason. When we make mistakes, turn against God, or run into trouble, we cry out to God. He is ready to help us repent or change direction. When surrounded by evil, we cry out to God. He not only hears us, but changes and removes the things that damage us. God even moves to heal our soul if it's been damaged. Our Lord and Savior knows us well and understands the difficulty Satan causes us. You know, it's amazing to me as I look at the world, a lot of people doing a lot of things and everybody's asking a question, is there more to this life? And the answer is, yes, there is. The Bible speaks to us and says that Jesus Christ has given us eternal life. What does that mean? It says if you invite him into your life and if you make him Lord of your life, you will have the gift of eternal life. Do that today. Invite Jesus into your life and become a forever person.